Psalm chapter 103, a very familiar and famous, for a good reason, psalm. But one I, I share with you this morning with a great, great purpose and intentionality. You know, I was thinking this week as we prepare to, to, to leave for vacation for a few weeks and to spend time with our family in North Carolina, visiting our grandparents and uh, of course, they don't want to see us anymore. Now they just want to see all our children. And as we're getting ready to go on this journey and drive to North Carolina this week, I was thinking about the journeys I took as a child. And one of them was actually going from North Carolina to Florida. And if you remember in the late 70s, early 80s, the common mode of transportation for a young family was a full-length station wagon fully equipped with wood paneling on the side, vinyl seats, and no air condition. Do you remember those? Some of you drove them. Listen, we had one, and I remember it. Oh, boy, do I remember it. I remember riding that back seat from North Carolina to Florida to go on a trip to Disney World one year, just as a, a young boy, and I remember it being really hot, and you know, when it's really hot and the windows are rolled down and the heat is just swirling around in the car and the vinyl seats in a car with no tent on the windows kind of begins to cook you and you feel like that frog in a pot of boiling water, you just begin to thirst. And while you can drink a little bit to satisfy that initial thirst, you have parents that want to make sure we get down the road in an expedited fashion. We want to move down the road. We don't want to stop unnecessarily so they don't give you a lot of drink because you might have to have extra bathroom stops. And so they're rationing the drink for you while you're struggling and thirsting back there. And I remember at this one point in the trip, and this became a common phrase that I learned to hear and live with as a child. I remember one point in the trip saying, Mom, Dad, I'm thirsty. And almost in stereo, in unison, they responded back to me, their young son, thirsting, excited about going to Disney World with this phrase and this advice, swallow your spit. <laughs> swallow your spit? That's the best you've got for me? And the, the funny thing about that advice is it's impossible. The reason you can't swallow your spit is because you're thirsty. And the reason you're thirsty is you don't have any way to cure that thirst from within yourself. I thought about that this week as I was thinking of this psalm. Because this psalm is actually speaking to a very similar spiritual condition that many Christians suffer from. A spiritual thirst that they have no ability within themselves to meet or to satisfy, and yet desire to be quenched with the satisfying nourishment of a closeness of our Savior. Where does that spiritual satisfaction come, on, come from? And how do we acquire that spiritual nourishment and not begin to suffer from spiritual dehydration? Listen, we have to be honest. Many of us today even are struggling with, why don't I have spiritual passion that I once did? Why don't I have the affection for God that motivates me to do great things for him? Why don't I feel like getting up and spending time with God, spending moments and even durations in prayer and in Bible study? Why is it that I don't feel this affection within me? Why is it that I feel either spiritually lethargic or apathetic or, yes, even spiritually dehydrated? Well, this is what this psalm is all about. It's not recognized as that very commonly because the bits and pieces pulled out are used for different points of emphasis. But collectively as a whole, when you look at this psalm, this is exactly what the psalmist is struggling with because it's not uncommon for God's people to feel this way. And in fact, David, a man after God's own heart, struggled with feeling the passion for God. And therefore, in the midst of that spiritual thirst, he penned these words and provided for us a solution to answer the question, how do you quench your spiritual thirst? 
It may be appropriate as well to ask this question. How do I worship when I don't feel like it? It's the same thing. It's the same connotation. It's the same truth and principle. And the answer is in Psalm 103, provided by God himself. So if you found your place there, let's read together this psalm in its entirety. And let's discern what God has for us today. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, and who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide or discipline, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to this inspiring passage in your word, Lord, we pray that you would arrest the attention of our hearts even at this moment. Father, that you would superintend our time together. Lord, and that you would allow us to experience the moving of your Holy Spirit transforming our lives to those who are spiritually renewed, those who worship you in spirit and in truth, those who continually offer a sacrifice of praise as the fruit of the lips that bear your name. Oh God, teach us by your word, empower us by your spirit, and transform us into the likeness of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. This passage is so rich with meaning and truth. In fact, it calls one of the greatest preachers to ever live, Charles Spurgeon, to write these words in referring to it. It says, there is too much in the psalm for a thousand pens to write. It is one of those all-comprehending scriptures, which is a Bible in and of itself. And it might alone almost suffice as the hymn book for the church. Spurgeon had recognized the depths of the jewels and the treasures that lie within this psalm. And while we don't have time to fully expose all of them in our time together this morning, I want us to understand how God desires to quench and satisfy the thirsty soul. How he desires us to worship and praise him even when we don't feel like it. How can we do that? Well, the passage itself actually breaks down into three very clear segments. The theme of it is also very clear. The theme of this passage is certainly praise or blessing towards God. You see it by the fact that it begins and ends with this theme. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Six times repeated. Twice at the beginning, four times at the end. And this bless the Lord actually has progression within it that we'll see as we walk through it. So praise is the theme. The structure actually moves and progresses as well. In the first five verses, you see a personal praise. In verses six through 18, you actually see a corporate praise. And in verse 19 
through 22, you see universal praise. Moving from the most inward praise to the universal praise of God. So how is it that we get in on this? How is it that we benefit from this and participate in this? Well, those three segments actually provide three principles by which we can worship and find the thirst or the satisfying quench for our spiritual thirst. The first principle is this. If we want to worship God in spirit and truth, if we want to satisfy the thirsty soul, we must stimulate our affections for the Lord. We must stimulate our affections for the Lord. In the first five verses, the psalmist begins to incite his soul to praise. Many times when we read this, we think as though he's exclaiming praise to God. But here at the beginning of the psalm, he's actually inwardly reflecting and recognizing the spiritual slumber that his soul is sleeping through. His soul is is needing an awakening, an arousal. And so he incites his soul by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He's stimulating his affections for the Lord. How do we stimulate our affections? How do we overcome the spiritual slumber and apathy we feel? Well, he does it in two segments. We can follow suit. The first way is this. To stimulate our affections for the Lord, we should declare his blessings. We should declare his blessings. Look at the first two verses. To declare his, God's blessing, he describes and mentions the Lord by personal covenant name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He doesn't say bless God in a generic form or fashion. He occupies it based on the principle and the premise that he has a personal relationship with God. And that's what's necessary for you and me. Some of us need to realize that our spiritual apathy is actually spiritual corpse. In other words, if we don't have a spiritual desire, it may be because we're spiritually dead. The basis and foundation for all spiritual worship and passion and desire stems from a personal relationship that you you have with God. And the psalmist demonstrates that by referring to the covenant name, Yahweh, bless the Lord, O my soul. Then you'll also recognize the comprehensive passion that he desires to incite consumes all of him. He mentions, oh, my soul, and then elaborates that by saying, and all that is within me. He wants it to be with his total being, the essence of his being, the core and seat of his emotions, all that he is to worship God. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. It's predicated on this relationship with God. It finds its meaning in the totality of our being given over and surrendered to this God we know. And then it's accentuated by the perfection of God that you see demonstrated in his holy name. To bless God's holy name refers to all that God is, all of who he is, considering who God is in his eminence, in his transcendence, his personal closeness as well as his being that is far beyond our comprehension. Bless his holy name. This is how we must begin to incite our soul to worship. This means, regardless of circumstances, regardless of feeling, regardless of emotions, regardless of familiarity of song, regardless of the tone of worship, regardless of the style of worship, regardless of the format of a worship service, we must incite our souls to worship him. It is not based on superficial matters. It is based on the essence of a relationship with him, the core of our being, given all the way to all of him. Declare God's blessings, even when we don't feel like it, when circumstances are too heavy, when we're discouraged, when we're depressed, when we're going through trials, make the conscious choice, just like Job did at the end of Job chapter one, when he said, the Lord giveth, And the Lord take it away, what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even in the midst of circumstances that were less than ideal, Job could worship. Declare God's blessings. That's how we stimulate our affections for God. But there's another way that he moves into, not only declaring God's blessings, but dwelling on God's benefits will stimulate our affections for God. In verses three through five, he actually moves towards 
the benefits that we're reminded of and conscious of. He now transitions from bless the Lord and inciting his soul to worship. As he does that, he now moves from inciting his soul to actually the means by which that will happen. Looking at the, the fuel for the fire and dumping it on there, saturating his soul with the flammatory fluid of the benefits of God, the blessings of God. Forget not his benefits. That doesn't mean that you would ever intentionally not think about them or forget them like they never happened, but to intentionally dwell on them, be conscious of them, be aware of them, be focused on them. And he lists five in these three verses. Look at what he says. He forgives, he heals, he redeems, he crowns, and he satisfies. This is what God has done for every person that has a personal relationship with him. It begins with the fundamental aspects of that relationship. He forgives all your iniquities. He cleanses them. He washes them away. All of your iniquities, not some of them, past, present, future. Not just the ones people know about, but the, people, the ones people don't know about. He forgives all of your iniquity. Therefore, he is worthy of our praise. Why? Because he forgives. He pardons, as some translations render it. But he doesn't just forgive. He also heals all our diseases, primarily stemming from the understanding of the forgiveness that he offers. This would be a spiritual healing that we experience. All the sinful sickness that we struggle with, the sickness of sinfulness is healed by God. But I do believe that the psalmist here is inferring a double meaning, speaking to our physical sicknesses and struggles. Now, it doesn't offer a promise of immunity, that we won't ever be sick or that every sickness we have will instantly be cured. But what he does say is that every healing we experience is divine. He heals all our diseases. If you've experienced healing from something as simple as a common cold, it may have been assisted by some sort of medicine that you took, but guess what? God's the one who healed you. He heals all our infirmities spiritual and physical, the sufferings we have, his healing hand is the one who provides the cure. But he doesn't just forgive. He doesn't just heal. He redeems your life from the pit. Literally, he rescues you, not only from the pit of destruction, those that are destined to endure in eternity, but also the, the pointless life, the pit that is found in lostness and struggle, that has no purpose and meaning, apart from knowing God. He has redeemed our life from purposelessness, from the pit of suffering and struggle apart from him. But he doesn't just redeem us, he crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, the crown jewels of heaven. Love and mercy showered upon us, placed upon our heads. Then lastly, he says, he satisfies us with good. This is the, the picture of that thirsty soul being quenched. We are satisfied with the things of God. That's the things that are good. Listen, this life and this earthly culture that we live in will try to convince you that what we need is something they can offer and that that's what's good. Listen, the things of God are the things that truly satisfy. Finding our satisfaction in what he supplies. He is sufficient. And therefore, it does what? It renews our youth like the eagles. It overcomes not just our physical age, not just our spiritual age that oftentimes brings apathy with it, but it renews our vigor as though we are a newborn believer again. We have the strength and the enthusiasm and the passion of when we first were saved. This renewal comes from declaring God's blessing, from dwelling on his benefits, Focusing on him. Listen, this morning, some of us need a jump start. Our spiritual batteries have worn down. And we need to hook up to the benefits and the praise of God and connect those cables and allow him to jump start our hearts to awaken us. Some of us need to stop hitting the snooze button on the spiritual alarm that God is trying to sound in our hearts and lives and stimulate our affections for God. This is where it begins. So the first truth and principle 
of quenching your spiritual thirst is that we must stimulate our affections for God. The second principle he points out is that we must meditate on the attributes of God. Meditating on the attributes of the Lord. The next section within this psalm, starting in verse 6 and going through verse 18, focus on attributes of God. Then it describes man's perspective in light of these attributes of God, who we are in light of who God is, and therefore bringing us to the resolution of how we should respond. So how do we meditate on the attributes of the Lord? The psalmist goes into now this corporate understanding, right? He's not just looking within his own soul at the personal experience of worship, but he's now uniting with other believers who understand these same benefits and helping them to focus or meditate on the attributes of God. How do we do this? What are the attributes we have to understand? Well, understand this. This is the umbrella that they fall under. God's character is flawless. God's character is flawless. When we begin to dwell on God and who he is, he is so perfect and beautiful to behold. It's something that we can't take our eyes off of. And in these next several verses, up through verse 14, he actually describes six aspects of his character that are flawless and perfect. Look at them with me. The first one he identifies is his justice. He says his justice is impartial. Verse six, the Lord works righteousness, and I believe, stemming from where we get uh, our national anthem and words in our Pledge of Allegiance, excuse me, it comes from this verse. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He actually brings up the, 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 the recount and the historical record of how the people had been oppressed, his people, the Israelites had been oppressed under the rule of Pharaoh in Egypt. He made way, had known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel, meaning he served them with justice. He stood by them and did what was right. Listen, you want to stimulate your affections for God and as you're meditating on the, the attributes of God, remember, his justice is impartial. He rewards fairly, accordingly to his character. But it's not just his justice that's impartial. The next one he mentions is his character, his nature is impeccable. Meaning you can't in any way incriminate God's character. It's impeccable. Look at how he describes it in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. No less than six other times in scripture this verse is repeated precisely with the same wording. Describing the very character of God. Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. If you were just to look at those four aspects of his character mentioned within that verse, you come to the conclusion of he's flawless. His character, his nature is perfect. He's merciful and gracious. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us more than we deserve. Mercy, grace, two sides of the same coin. He's slow to anger, meaning he's patient with our shortcomings, and he's overflowing in loving kindness. His nature, his character is impeccable. But then he describes not just those things, he describes his kindness. Look in verse 9. His kindness is inconceivable. He will not always discipline or chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. Isn't it amazing that when God looks at us, he knows all the things we've done, and yet he treats us as though we never have. He treats us as though we have, are operating from a clean slate. His kindness is inconceivable. We don't deserve that. In fact, we would acknowledge our sins, our iniquities, our deserving to be disciplined. And while he affirms that it's certain that he will discipline, the merciful and kindness of his character requires that that discipline will not last forever. He will not chide always, nor keep his anger forever, because he will not deal with us according to our sins or even repay us according to our iniquities. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. His kindness is inconceivable. Look now at the next attribute he gives to him. His mercy, in verse 11, is immeasurable. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
So great is his steadfast love, his mercy, his hesed in the original, towards those who fear him. He now uses an analogy that everyone knows is immeasurable. Where does earth begin and earth end and heaven begin? Where does that start? Where does that happen? It's immeasurable, and he's using it to show the depths of his mercy towards us. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so is, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Again, bringing it back to those who are in a relationship with him. His mercy is immeasurable, but his forgiveness is infinite. He then describes it with these other familiar verses. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. His forgiveness is infinite. East and west, just like the heavens and earth, can never be reconciled. The same way, God's forgiveness is offered to us. You know, there are many people who struggle as though guilt is hiding in the next room. That their skeletons in their closet had never really been cleaned out. But if you've given them to God, if you've turned them over to him, the forgiveness he offers removes them as far as the east is from the west. His forgiveness is infinite. And then lastly, in verse 13 and 14, what you see him describe is his compassion. And his compassion is intimate. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. You know what that means? God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the flaws we have. He knows the shortcomings, the imperfections, the struggles. He knows all these things. He knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. He knows that we are finite beings. Because of that, His compassion is given to us and extended in the most personal way. As a father extends compassion to his children, the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, those who have a reverence for him, those who are worshiping him, those who are exclaiming, bless the Lord, oh my soul, I am constantly aware of my need of your forgiveness and you're continually extending it to me. So, Focusing on, meditating on the attributes of God brings us to the conclusion God's character is flawless. His justice impartial. His nature impeccable. His kindness inconceivable. His mercy immeasurable. His forgiveness infinite and his compassion is intimate. God's character is flawless. In light of those things, the psalmist arrives at the same place we do. How inadequate are we? How unworthy are we? Well, that's the next aspect of meditating on the attributes of God. Recognizing God's character is flawless Brings us to the other understanding that man's condition is futile. Man's condition is futile. This is what the psalmist says. As for man, his days are like grass. We know what grass does. It blooms for a season, and then it goes dormant. Withers away, it dies. He flourishes like a flower of the field. He's not saying that our life is worthless or meaningless, but he's saying there's only a temporal value to it. And yet... For the wind, as it passes over it, blows the bloom or the blossom off the flower, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. It's no longer there. This is the futile condition of our sinful condition, of our humanity that we all bear, none more than any other. We all suffer from the same futility, and it's seen in direct contrast to the infinite worth and the attributes of God that are flawless and impeccable. So our condition is futile. So as he's remembering these things, you say, well, if he's calling us to remember these things, isn't that going to discourage us or depress us? Well, if you continue to focus on our condition. But he gives us great example. It's not focusing on our condition. It makes us aware of it. That humbles us to then, again, reflect back on who God is, which brings us to understand that God's compassion is forever. His character is flawless. Man's condition is futile. Thank God, then, that his compassion is forever, which is exactly what he says next. Verse 17, but the steadfast love, the enduring, eternal love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. That's infinity to infinity, to eternity past to eternity future. For those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, 
Meaning that he will continue to show this generation after generation after generation. His compassion will be demonstrated and proven. Focusing, meditating on the attributes of the Lord. This is what the psalmist does as he's inciting his soul to worship. And he begins to relish in these things. How is it that we can meditate on the attributes of the Lord? Well, I'm mindful of the apostle's words in Colossians 3, 2, when he said, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. I'm mindful of the apostle's words in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 8, where he said, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is there of good repute, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I'll leave it to you to take those six characteristics that he just described in Philippians 4, 8, and to parallel them with the six attributes he describes in Psalm 103. I'll leave it to you to draw the connection to see, hey, dwell on, focus on these things with what he says, and forget not focusing and dwelling on these same things. He said, okay, well, if I'm supposed to meditate on the attributes of God, let's recognize and maybe put it in terms we can understand. If you're gonna get healthy, Physically, you have to guard your physical health from two sides. One, you focus on what you're supposed to eat, and two, you focus on what you're not supposed to eat, right? You're focused on the things you can't eat or shouldn't eat that contribute to bad health, and you also simultaneously focus on the things you should. If we're going to meditate on the attributes of God, we have to recognize that we have to stop filling our minds and our hearts and our souls with those things that are spiritually unhealthy. Why is it that you feel lethargic? You've been eating spiritual junk food. Why is it that I don't feel spiritually healthy? I have not been consuming enough of the attributes and the healthy things of God. This is the balance that we have to find. This is the discipline that it requires. But this is the soul that makes an intentional, conscious choice to meditate, meditate on the attributes of God. It really comes down to two things, self-consciousness and God-consciousness. Being honest with God about where you are spiritually and then being constantly aware of all that he is and allowing him to transform you. Meditating on the attributes of God. But there's a third principle. Not only must we stimulate our affections for God, meditate on the attributes of God, he concludes with this. We must celebrate the authority of God. Celebrate the authority of the Lord. Now this seems like a contradiction in terms at first glance. How is it that if I'm looking for the freedom of my soul to express praise and glory and honor to God, that I actually celebrate the authority he has over my soul. But submitting to his authority frees you from sin's authority. This is where you want to operate. This is where you want to be. And now the psalmist has made full circle, moving from the personal praise in verses 1 through 5 to the corporate praise and worship in verses 6 through 18 to now the universal praise and worship in verse 19 through 22 submitting to and celebrating the authority of the Lord. Look at what he says. To celebrate the authority of the Lord, we must first and foremost submit to God's word. Submit to God's word. This has authority over our life. Look at what he says in verse 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels. In other words, he moves beyond. He says, listen, even the ones who are more worthy than we are, who are angelic beings, should still submit to him how much more should we, who aren't angelic beings, but in fact, we are the epitome of God's creation created in his image, submit to his word. Bless the Lord, you his angels, the mighty ones. You see the emphasis on their strength, and yet their strength is still submitted to God's strength. How? Those who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. You want to worship God. It's through a willful, intentional, spirit-empowered obedience that allows you to truly worship God and drink from the, third, the, the spiritual nourishment and living water that he's giving. 
Obeying God. Someone once told me, you want to know about God? Know his word. You want to know God? Obey his word. It's submitting to his authority. Submitting to the authority of his word begins to celebrate his authority in our life. Listen, we begin to worship God when we recognize, God, I gave myself to you in more moments today. There were more times where I didn't give in to that emotional outburst that I submitted it to your authority and handled it the way you said. That begins to fan the flame of your affections for God. That begins to get you excited about walking with God, following God, obeying God, knowing God. It's by obeying and submitting to his word. Celebrating his authority over our life, not resisting it. We live in an anti-authoritarian culture that resists any kind of authority. You see insubordination all over the place, in workplace and in families and in schools. Even in our personal lives when we are insubordinate to God. He says, you want to worship me, submit to me. You can't expect that your heart will overflow with joy and gratitude if you're not bowing down in worship. That comes through submitting to God's word, but it also comes through satisfying God's will. Look at what he says next. Bless the Lord, all his hosts. Now he moves into the generic servants of God. Those in heaven and those on earth. Those who minister. Those who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works. All of creation, speaking to the sovereign rule of God that he accentuated with great exclamation in verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. He has universal authority and therefore all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Worship is found in recognizing God's universal sovereignty and control over our lives, our circumstances, and submitting to his word and satisfying his will. God, I will do what you tell me. God, I will offer my life as a testimony of praise. Even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't want to, even when I want to do other things, God, by your spirit's power, I will worship you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. What a powerful psalm. Starts with him inciting his soul to wake up and worship, ending with the very thing he sought to do. And through the steps he took, by stimulating his affections for God, by meditating on the attributes of God, and by celebrating the authority of God, he concludes with the very exclamation of praise that he was inciting his soul to offer to begin with. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Would you bow with me?